Hello everyone, I am the Meta Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Album format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews and other deck techs. On this episode of The Brewery, I'll be discussing my take on a Commander background pairing from Baldur's Gate, Rasad Dungeon Delver. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description, it'll really help out the channel. The best way you can help support the channel is my Patreon. For just $1, patrons get early access to certain videos on YouTube. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. You can also support my channel for free by simply liking, subscribing, and sharing which also helps out a lot. I put out a video every Monday, so you don't want to miss out. You can join my Discord server for free if you want to join the Commander Tavern community. All pertinent links are down in the description. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Rasad is a 0-3 human monk with choose a background for 2 generic and 1 white. While having zero power might seem like a drawback, he has a static ability wherein all of our creatures assign combat damage per their toughness than power, which is already an amazing ability. Granted, there are similar commanders with this ability, but there's more. If we were to have the initiative and then attack with Rasad, then he doubles the toughness of all of the creatures we control, essentially doubling the attack of all of our creatures. Unfortunately, he doesn't give us the initiative himself, but that's fine since that's what the cards in the 99 are for. Since he does care about having the initiative, I chose Dungeon Delver as his background. Giving him access to blue is already a good idea since there are plenty of zero power slash high toughness creatures in blue, and there's a ton of adventure and initiative cards in these colors too. Undercity already has many useful rooms, since we're venturing through it via the initiative, we might as well make the most of it. Speaking of the initiative, unfortunately Rasada doesn't give it to us, but that's okay, we still got some solutions in the 99. The deck's running Tomb of Horrors Adventurer, White Plume Adventurer, Goliath Paladin, Arakokra Sneak, Feywild Caretaker, Sarabox Tome, Underseller Sweep, and Dungeoneer's Pack. All of these, except for the last one, give us the initiative when entering the battlefield. While Goliath Paladin and Arakokra Sneak are included solely for giving us the initiative, the other cards are still useful. The two adventurers care about us completing a dungeon, which is going to be very easy to do with this deck. They're still amazing even before we do, since the blue one copies the second spell we cast all for free, and the white one untaps a creature we control on each opponent's upkeep. But we get two copies with the blue one if we completed a dungeon, and we untap all of our creatures with the white one instead. That alone is incredibly busted considering we want to be swinging in with our big bootied creatures without running the risk of not having blockers available. Fey Wild Caretaker gives us a 1-1 flyer if we maintain the initiative, which isn't nothing, and Under Solar Sweep gives us two 1-1s one when attacking. Dungeoneer's pack needs to be tapped and sacrificed for two, but at least we take the initiative, gain three life, draw a card, and create a treasure, which isn't that bad when you factor in the cost. Sarabox Tome is perhaps the most busted of these because it's a mana rock that enters untapped, all while giving us the initiative. So at the very least, it's tapping for two colorless that same turn. To top it off, if we complete a dungeon, we get an extra ability that allows us to cast a spell for free from the top of our library. This is absolutely busted in this deck considering how quickly we'll be completing dungeons, especially under city since we have so many ways to take the initiative. Keep in mind that the initiative does not work like Monarch, we can take the initiative even if we already have it. Midnight, Path Lighter, and Radiant Solar help us clear out dungeons faster and give us access to the other three dungeons, assuming we're not still in the Undercity. If we were in Undercity, we can simply venture through it and once completed, venture into a new, different dungeon. In any case, these creatures are super busted in the deck. The Path Lighter not only essentially makes our creatures unblockable, but whenever any of our creatures hit an opponent, we venture into the dungeon. If you want to maximize its effect, you do have to hit as many opponents as you can though. At least the Angel doesn't have that problem. Whenever it or another non-token creature enters the battlefield, we venture into the dungeon. This is super good with creatures that give us the initiative as well, since we're going through that same dungeon further for just one creature. Speaking of value when dungeoneering, Hama Pashara Ruin Seeker is redundancy for Rasad's background. If we have her out when we also have Rasad at his background, we're going to be getting so much value from our dungeons. We'll be drawing thrice as many cards, creating thrice as many tokens, etc. While these dungeons are incredibly modular and versatile, allowing us to choose whichever next room would be the best when venturing, let me at least show you my preferred pass when venturing through each dungeon. With Undercity, the one we'll probably be venturing through most, it's pretty clear. Being able to trigger secret entrance multiple times is amazing because we'll fetch for basics right to our hand. Unfortunately, they don't go to the battlefield, but at least it's guaranteed our lad drops. Keep in mind that Forge will not abow most of the time with the deck's synergies since the plus one plus one counters will be increasing a creature's power. That being said, we can just put them on the creatures that benefit more from them. The reason we go through this room is because we'd rather take that chance for a Nambo to go through trap. Having a player lose 5 life multiple times is no joke, especially when we have them on the ropes. 
While this is an amazing dungeon to crawl through, I also like traversing Lost Mine of Fandelver since it also has a little bit of everything useful. Keep in mind that we can only venture through here thanks to Midnight, Path Lighter, and Radiant Solar. This is the ideal path, to me at least, because we get card advantage, mana acceleration, and we can ping the table for one. Dungeon of the Mad Mage is another dungeon I've ventured through, but only for grindier games since it takes quite the effort to complete. But once we do have Midnight Path Lighter and Radiant Solar, we can potentially complete this one much faster. While there aren't many options in terms of room choices, this is my preferred path if it came down to it. The fourth dungeon, Tomb of Annihilation, is not a dungeon I venture through in this deck. If there were cards in these colors that prized you for the number of differently named dungeons that are completed, then definitely. But only one cares about that and she's a mono green planeswalker, so the previously shown dungeons it is. As for synergizing with Rasad caring about that cake, the deck has plenty of toughness matters cards and effects in it. A quarter shield, Cathar's shield, kite shield, and slagwork armor all make Rasad very dangerous and can help him potentially one shot an opponent out of nowhere. While the first three seem completely identical, pay attention because Kite Shield doesn't grant Vigilance like the other two do. That being said, a 3 damage boost at minimum for just 3 total mana is good enough. Slagwork Armor isn't free, but it only costs 1, and gives double the damage boost for the same equip cost, so it does a ton of work. Bulb's Armor is another card that does a lot of work here. While it is possible to have negative power, it doesn't matter because we're dealing damage thanks to toughness, so this is an amazing mana sink. In response to Rasad's trigger, when we have the initiative, we can activate this and really get a huge boost in damage. We don't even need to sink that much mana into it. E Honda Sumo Champion is another busted way to pump toughness. Not only is this a redundant way of having our creatures deal damage equal to their toughness instead, but whenever E Honda attacks, up to 100 creatures each get plus 0 plus X, where X is the amount of cards in our hand. Granted, we're not going to be controlling 100 creatures anytime soon, but it's still safe to say that this will suffice for our entire board. Since the deck is half blue, you know we're going to have a huge hand anyways. We can also stack these effects accordingly. If we have E Honda's trigger resolve first, our creatures will get a huge toughness pump before Rasad doubles them, which makes it way larger than if we mess up and do it the other way around. The stack matters, so keep that in mind. High Alert is some more redundancy for Rasad's ability, but also has the added bonus of allowing our creatures with Defender to be able to attack. The deck doesn't have that many, but it's still worth having since it does so much, like being able to untap a creature, allowing us to untap a huge blocker in a pinch. Tetsuko Umezawa, Fugitive, and Archetype of Imagination help us make sure we get those big booty creatures through. These were the non-boats that I mentioned when talking about going through Forge in Undercity. If our creature's power is 0 or 1, Tetsuko makes them unblockable. If they had too many plus 1 plus 1 counters, that's not going to happen. At least with the archetype, it's not going to matter because they'd only be blocked by creatures with reach. Access Tunnel, Rogue's Passage, and Skeleton Key are included as more ways to try and make our creatures unblockable, at the very least Rasad, so we can get that commander damage win. Access Tunnel cares about power, which is fine since most of the creatures in the deck have zero power. For just one more mana, we have Rogue's Passage just in case. But in any case, it doesn't matter because these are lands and don't take up card slots. Skeleton Key is clutch because if we give Skulk to a creature with zero power, we're essentially making it unblockable. Only zero powered creatures would be able to block them. Giraffe Visionary Stitcher also takes advantage of those heavy bottomed creatures by giving us huge zombies instead. Giraffe himself has that cake, so don't count him out either. That being said, being able to sacrifice a wall in order to get a huge flyer is nothing to scoff at. Yes, don't forget that he gives our zombies flying, so if we can't attack against the heavily defended board, take it to the air. Mirren the Moni Wall, another card that doesn't take up a slot in the deck, is another way to turn our bootylicious creatures into value. If we really are in dire straits, we can sacrifice a creature in a pinch to gain a ton of life, especially if we were able to pump its toughness beforehand. Some of those bootylicious creatures being Forbidding Watchtower, Shield Sphere, and Aegis Turtle. These are the cheapest ones in the deck, with the first two being free. Well, for all effects and purposes, playing the Watchtower is free, but we do have to pay 2 mana to activate it. That being said, it doesn't take up a slot in the deck. Shield Sphere can attack unless it's allowed to, but for 0 mana, we have a blocker that's going to deal a ton of damage to whatever it blocks. Just remember that it gets the minus 0, minus 1 counter on blocks, so it's going to receive it before dealing damage. But if you're able to attack with it, always use it on the offensive. 6 damage for 0 mana is nothing to scoff at. The turtle is 5 damage for just 1 mana and it doesn't have defender. Its inclusion here is a no brainer. Dragon's Eye Savants, Dream Stalker, Giant Ox, Nyx Fleet's Ram, Surge Mare, Tide Drifter, Crashing Drawbridge, Fortified Rampart, and Roll of Glare are the next round of creatures since they all cost just 2 mana to cast. That's the beauty of decks where damage cares about toughness rather than power. 
Powerful creatures are overcosted, but bullylicious creatures tend to be practically free. At least of all these, only the last three can't attack without special effects, but they're still useful. The drawbridge gives haste to all of our creatures is clutch in an aggressive deck like this one, and Wall of Glare being able to block any number of creatures is choice. Special shout out as well to Dreamstalker, since it bounces a creature when it enters the battlefield, which is great for bouncing an initiative creature in order to recast them and retake the initiative. Wall of Denial, Chyrex the Raging Isle, and Indomitable Ancients are the final creatures in the deck, and the most expensive of these, which is crazy when you think about it. Chyrex is a 4-drop creature that's going to be dealing a whopping 17 mana without any further pump. Imagine making this unblockable when Rasad had doubled his toughness, all on a 4-drop. The other two at 8 and 10 toughness are still amazing as well. It's just that I put them next to Chyrex so they don't seem that impressive in comparison, but these do some serious work regardless. The following cards in the deck are the essential card advantage, responses, and mana acceleration of any deck. While there is plenty of room across all four dungeons that can draw us cards each time we venture through them, plus the benefit of triggering rooms multiple times, we're getting plenty of value. However, that might not be enough. Fortunately, the deck is half blue, so we have access to spells like Blue Sun Zenith, Commander's Insight, Divinus Portent, Drawn in Dreams, Even the Score, Sphinx's Revelation, and Stroke of Genius, which give us something to do with all that mana we're keeping open for responses. If we don't have anything to do, just sync it all at the beginning of the end step before our turn to fill our hand with goodies. The deck draws enough cards where including Thought Vessel, Decanter of Endless Water, and Reliquary Tower isn't unwarranted. The deck isn't green so it's going to need mana rocks. Anyways, plus Reliquary Tower doesn't take up a slot in the deck for being a mana generating land that doesn't enter the battlefield tapped. As for the interaction we're holding up mana for, Flawless Maneuver, Teferi's Protection, Grand Crescendo, and Your Temple is Under Attack are key. The deck is aggro and creature based so we want to survive as many wraths as possible. These get the job done at least. As a bonus, Grand Contrendo can have mana sunk into it to get more bodies on the board for chump blocking. The deck is also running an Offer You Can't Refuse, Swan Song, and Fierce Guardianship, which not only double to counter said board wipes, but also prevent any combo player from comboing off and stealing the win from us that way. As for similar matchups, Overloading Cyclonic Rift gets the job done. The deck aims to win out of nowhere with a bunch of big booty creatures, so an empty board is the best board to attack into. Miss Veil Plains and Mystic Sanctuary are the final pieces of interaction and, best of all, don't take up slots in the deck. Oh, and they can be fetched for as well. Unfortunately, the Plains enters tapped so we can't use it that same turn, but at least we can have it at the ready. In terms of powering these effects, Core Cartographer and Solemn Simulacrum ramp us for a land when they enter the battlefield. Granted, they're a bit pricey at 4 mana, but White has to take what it can get. At least the Cartographer can get us non-basic Plains. Wayfarer's Bobble, Navigation Orb, and Burnished Heart are some more universal land-based ramp effects but can also be used once because they require getting sacrificed to work. But that's fine, beggars can't be choosers. That being said, Sword of the Animus and Sword of Hearth and Home are repeatable land ramp effects. Granted, they're tied to attacking but this deck is aggressive anyways. As a bonus, Sword of Hearth and Home can blink one of our creatures which can be a great way at getting back the initiative by blinking one of those creatures that give it to us when entering the battlefield. But even so, they're here mostly because land-based ramp will always be better than mana rocks. Speaking of, at the very least, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Azoria Signet, and Talisman of Progress are included. They are very cheap to cast and on curve in the early game, so we might as well. But at least this is all a decent enough mana acceleration package for the deck all things considered. The rest of the deck is just the rest of the lands. The deck's running all 7 fetch lands, Hallowed Fountain, Prairie Stream, Irrigated Farmland, Glacial Floodplain, Sea of Clouds, Mystic Gate, Command Tower, and Ancient Tomb, as well as 6 of each basic land, as previously mentioned, to make the most of the basic land ramp effects in the deck. As with all of my deck techs, you can build your mana base according to your budget, whether you include more expensive cards or even cheaper cards is up to you. You do you. This brews just an idea of how to build around Rasad Yin Bashir. While you can definitely pair him with absolutely any background you want, admittedly this one seems to be clearly beneficial due to us wanting to have the initiative, which is inherently tied to Undercity, which is a dungeon. In that sense, the deck is pretty straightforward. Attack with cheap to cast creatures that deal a ton of damage, all while venturing through dungeons for value. If you're interested in the deck list of this spicy brew of mine, you can find a link to it down in the description. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me, and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the Brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link. That also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of the Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I am the Benedict Kirby, and happy brewing.